Well, it's 12 noon. Thanks for coming back on time. Uh, I got page 20 up here. There was a request for another page as well. Uh, series page 20. Uh, and then somebody asked for the first page. Uh, I, I will definitely get that. Uh, so remind me at the beginning of the next break. I'm assuming you're meaning the first page of the entire sequence of notes that I've done today. And yeah, that's no problem. We'll get that done. Uh, and any other pages too. But as far as where we left off, we had just gotten to this page. <clears throat> and let the... Oh. Yes, I did do uh, some lecture before I turned on my sound, but now I will restart. Uh, so um, I put page 20 up there. Um, I will put uh, any other pages you want up, um, either at the beginning of the next break or after lectures. For now, let's get back to new material. And we are, uh, it is noon, and um, I do want to uh, use our time effectively. So uh, let's pick up with the lecture notes where with what is the molar mass of ethanol? Uh, ethanol, so I've given you ethanol with this, um, what's called a structural formula that breaks it up into parts of the molecule. We're not expected to know anything about that yet, but sometimes we will see this. And when we're doing our molar masses, the key thing is to uh, make sure you count up all the carbons. And there are two carbons in this molecule. There are three plus two plus one or six H's and one oxygen. And um, so molar mass means use the numbers on the periodic table under each element's chemical symbol. So it's two times 12.01 grams per mole for carbon, six times 1.008 grams per mole hydrogen, and one times 16.00 grams per mole oxygen. And if we add those up, two times 12.01 plus six times 1.008 plus 16, I get 46 uh, to two decimal places, 46.07. Grams per mole and you can list it as CH3, CH2, OH. Okay. Now uh, we will work the next problem. The next problem says how many hydrogen atoms are in 32.3 grams of ethanol? You will see this type of question on the homework, so let's definitely do it. Uh, we have our given, which is the number in our problem statement. And, uh, oh, yeah, ethanol. You can write the formula. You can write the name. You just need something to designate what it is. And so I'm going to write CH3, CH2OH. You could also write C2H6O, just something that designates what the formula is. And I'm going to make a long, what I call, picket fence because we're gonna have a couple of unit conversions here. The first conversion I'm gonna do is going to use the molar mass. Molar mass is 46.07 grams of ethanol. Um, per one mole. Like so. And um, there's a couple different ways to do this. I'm going to then answer the question right here is uh, of in one mole of ethanol, how many moles of hydrogen are there? And what I would suggest to you is if that I have one mole of ethanol, well, let's, let's backtrack. If I have one molecule of ethanol, 
there were six hydrogens or six hydrogen atoms. If I have one mole of ethanol, you count them up and you get six and there will be six moles of hydrogen. So the six is just done by adding up six, uh, the number of hydrogens in the compound. And then now that I have moles of hydrogen in one mole of anything, there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of that thing. And in this particular case, since H uh, is an atom, we will do atoms of hydrogen. So now we have three unit conversion factors. It's starting to look a little bit more like a picket fence or a railroad tracks. Again, there are lots of ways to organize these unit conversion factors. This is just one. I'm gonna push things up a little bit. And then we have 32.3. Then we are dividing by 46.07. Then we are multiplying times six, and then we are multiplying times 6.022 exponent button 23rd. And I get 2.53, uh, where is that? Times 10 to the 24th atoms of hydrogen. So there you go. All right, back on screen there. So it's a long problem, and uh, again, step by step, we will practice. We will do this in lecture. We will practice it in homework. Um, this is a companion problem because it's very similar to the last one we did, except different compounds, calcium chloride here. Excuse me, sir. Question? Yes. Can we please go back to the other page? Before the CP so this page? Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Then we have companion problem. Now there's a couple more types of calculations we need to learn in this lecture outline. The next one is percentage composition by mass. And there's at least three different ways to refer to percentage composition by mass. It's percent by mass, percent m slash m, which is mass divided by mass, or percent w divided by w, which is weight divided by weight. Almost everything we do in this class is mass. The unit of mass is grams, so we've been using masses all along. But sometimes, especially in older things, or um, you'll find W by uh, divided by W as well, and sometimes in the medical field as well. Now, um, the first question we want to tackle is what is the mass percent carbon? And so mass percent carbon will be percent carbon mass by mass. And I'll give you the formula. So it's going to be uh, more mass of carbon And I've put molar mass of carbon in parentheses and then times number of carbons. So that's just a little scribble where I made a mistake. And then you're gonna divide that by the molar mass of the compound. And the compound is C6H5COOH, so molar mass of the compound, times 100%. That's the formula. Now let's apply it. And I'm gonna move my equal sign over a bit to make sure I have room. 
smaller mass of carbon straight off the periodic table 12.01 grams per mole carbon the number of carbons in this compound I see six I see one more so seven and that's going to be divided by the molar mass of the entire compound so we have seven carbons six hydrogens and two oxygens and we've demonstrated probably three or four different times how to do the molar mass so what I'd like to do is I'm just going to do it on my calculator now and so I have seven carbons which is the same as the first part but and then I'm going to add uh, six hydrogens times 1.08 plus two oxygens at 16 each and I get 122.118 I will go to 122.12 And then writing out the rest of the formula. Now I'm ready to do my math. It's numbers on the top divided by numbers on the bottom times 100. And I get 68.84. percent carbon mass by mass and that is a that is to the correct number of sig figs and I will always accept three sig figs so either of these answers is fine <clears throat> practice you can do the same thing again except for iron and again the answers for the companion problems are posted inside blackboard now let's talk about cheerios for a minute i had cheerios for breakfast yesterday and it's their perennial favorite of uh, mine and my daughters in our house and i was looking for um the fact that uh, for a problem where you could calculate using nutritional labels what the percent of a certain thing is and it turns out I don't know if you've ever seen this there's regular Cheerios and for a short time there was something called Cheerios protein and Cheerios protein the way it was being sold was that it had more protein that it was a good source of protein let's say and so when keto diets and um, that other one the one where you don't eat any uh, carbs I mean Cheerios are, are a large portion of carbohydrates so they wanted to seem like they had um, protein in them. Paleo, yes. No, oh, oh, and the other one was the Atkins diet, I think. Anyway, there's a number of these. Anyway, Cheerios is like, well, we have protein too. So uh, they um, put out this product called Cheerios Protein, and you can't buy it anymore, but here's the nutrition label for it. And in a serving size of one and a quarter cup or 55 grams, and I'm going to draw a line here because this is the data for the Cheerios and uh, Cheerios protein. In um, 55 gram uh, serving, there are oh, seven grams of protein. Okay. <clears throat> and then. Uh, this is actually a label from Cheerios where I took a picture of the Cheerios in my house and you can see that it's only got five grams of protein so sure Cheerios protein has more protein than this however they were sneaky the serving size was 39 grams so in 39 grams There were five grams of protein. And the question we're going to ask is, which has a higher percent mass percentage protein? 
And so we're going to do the same type of calculation. So it's going to be uh, percent protein mass by mass is this time going to be grams of protein divided by grams of sample times 100%. And again, this is for regular old Cheerios that I had for breakfast yesterday. I get five grams protein divided by 39 grams of sample times 100%. And if I do that math, five divided by 39 times 100, I get 12.8 percent protein mass by mass. Now let's do it for Cheerios protein. For Cheerios protein, for the Cheerios protein, so it's the same thing, but now we have seven grams of protein and 55 grams of sample. And when I work this out, seven divided by 55 times 100, I get 12.7% protein, mass by mass. And so it turns out that regular Cheerios and quote unquote Cheerios protein had the same amount of protein. The only difference was that if you eat more grams of it, you get more grams of protein. Of course, you get more grams of everything else as well. And as far uh, when I looked online, and I, I didn't verify this with Snopes, but it seemed like it could have been true, so therefore I went with it. Um, no, I think it was. So uh, Cheerios was sued, or General Mills was sued for false advertising be, or misleading advertising, certainly, because it's really the same thing. Anyway, what I love about chemistry and what I love about um, uh, science in general is it gives us the tools to evaluate people's claims. And we don't have to accept things just as they're presented. Anyway, and so and when you do the calculations, you can run the numbers and be like, well, I'm just going to eat regular Cheerios or, you know, what a scam <laughs> um, or what an attempted scam anyway. Uh, it's the same thing. I wonder if they charged more too. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so question, how can we determine uh, CP problems or companion problems? So companion problems, I always label them. So on the previous page, I labeled this one as a CP companion problem and we work through this one. And in case you were not here earlier or missed that part, so your lecture outlines, when you turn them in, have to have all of the stuff I do. You do not have to do the companion problems when, when you turn them in, um, and you'll still get full credit. If you do the companion problems, I think that's a wise choice to get good practice in, but you do not have to do them. So hopefully that answered your question. Okay. All right, so, and you can definitely not buy Cheerios protein anymore. I've looked. Um, question, when should we be writing in scientific notation for our answers, specifically decimal numbers? Great question. If you look at some of the calculations that I've done, um, you'll see that I, so first off, um, I, I only use scientific notation when there's lots of zeros, meaning it's either a very large or a very small number, like a number like 0 0.00642, I typically write with the zeros. You, but So the, the answer to your question is it, you can always write in scientific notation and you can always write in regular numbers if you want. Like I don't have a rule about it. Uh, the only thought that I would put into it is whatever's easiest for you. So this number for me, 
is easier to write not in scientific notation. Uh, in fact, sometimes my calculator uh, starts spitting out numbers in scientific notation, and I actually read the manual to figure out how to get it to go back to regular numbers. Um, unless it's like 6.3 x minute 16, 14 minus, like then it'll keep it in scientific notation uh, just because there's not enough zeros in there. But hopefully that answers your question. Like you can use either kind of number whenever you want in this class. I don't have um, a strong preference or any preference. Okay, so uh, here's another example of a problem that we can solve uh, using percent composition. It says the liquid in an intravenous or IV bag is 0.9% sodium chloride. That's what's considered isotonic, meaning the same type of um, concentration of ions as blood. How many grams of sodium chloride are there in a 1.00 liter bag of this solution? Assume that the density of the solution is 1.00 grams per milliliter, the same as water. So this is a percent by mass problem. And um, what I do when I'm stuck on a problem is I see this 0.9% sodium chloride, and I see that I'm being asked for grams of sodium chloride. So I'm going to write out the formula for percent sodium chloride. And it goes like this, 0.9% sodium chloride, mass by mass, equals blank grams of sodium chloride per blank grams of sample times 100%. And I may not know what the answers are, and I'm definitely showing my process here, but in chemistry, whenever you don't know how to solve a problem, write something that you do know and see if that helps. That's like my rule of thumb anyway. So let's see. Um, and I have a number here, and it means that if I can find one of these numbers, I can find the other one. And since I'm looking for grams of sodium chloride, I'm guessing that I'm not going to be able to find that in this problem statement. But I do see this one liter bag of the solution. So that's sort of our sample size. One point zero zero liters of solution is our sample. And it also tells us that the density is 1.00 grams per milliliter. So if I can turn these liters into milliliters, then I can turn the milliliters into grams. Now, uh, one liter, well, it'll self-convert itself, but one liter, if you remember, is 1,000 milliliters, or one milliliter equals one times 10 to the minus three liters. However you do it, this is a thousand milliliters. And for the density of the solution is 1.00 gram per milliliter. And so this is the density. And I get 1000 grams and I can put my 1,000 grams in here. Oop, I wrote my grams twice accidentally. So since, I, uh, and I'll cross out this one so there's only one. So the key takeaway for this one is, if you're not exactly sure what to do, start writing down some formulas you do know, because oftentimes if you do, you can then figure out what you do need. And now the next thing I wanna talk about is how to do the math for this. So the math for this, I would do, well, I would do it as a um, uh, cross multiplication problem. And so I would put this over one and then point nine, so then I'd cross multiply. And if I cross multiply, it's gonna be 0.9 times 1,000. So that's the top and the bottom on the other side equals to one times x times 100. So 
So, and this is the cross multiplication. Is 0.9 times a thousand equals one times x times a hundred. And once you've got this statement, then you can go ahead and solve it. So to get x by itself, divide through both sides by a hundred. And x equals, uh, let's see, the hundreds cancel. One is just one. So your answer is 0.9 times a thousand. Divided by a hundred. So I get X equals nine, and that nine is grams of sodium chloride. And I'm gonna go ahead and box that just so I can tell that the answers, that that's my final answer for this problem. And you don't have to box it. Normally I can find the final answer, but if it helps you stay organized and know that you've got the final answer, then great. Any questions about that? Okay. Well, uh, then let's keep going. Let's see, time-wise, we've been going for 27 minutes. Let's go a little bit longer. So we got one, two, let's at least get one more page done. All right, so the reason we just, one of the many reasons we just did percent by mass so uh, is that it's useful when thinking about a lot of things, especially in the medical field like we just did. But uh, in our class, it's gonna allow us to solve what are called empirical formula uh, problems. And the empirical formula, well, let's just discuss what that is. The empirical formula of molecules, and these are going to be with covalent bonds, as we will see. It is, the definition of it is, the formula with the smallest whole numbers possible. The formula with the smallest whole numbers possible. So for example, Glucose has a molecular formula of C6H12O6. And we can see that all these numbers can be divided by six to get, and that's the, the, the biggest thing it can be divided by. So we'll divide all of those by six. And we'll be left with C1H2O1. And that's zero, let's say this. Its empirical formula is C1H2O1. And you don't need the ones. So the only reason to have the ones be there uh, is just so you know <laughs> what the number is. But you can also write CH2O. And hopefully that makes sense because numbers are often placeholders uh, or sorry, one numbers are often placeholders to let you know that a number's there. Now, many compounds with different molecular formulas can have the same empirical formula. I'm showing four of them right here, and you don't have to know the names. The names are only here so that you can tell these are different compounds. But you can see that both of the numbers C3H6 can be divided by three, C4H8 can be divided by four, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these compounds have the same empirical formula. And then once you have the empirical formula, the way to get from empirical formula to molecular formula Use the molar mass.
And what I mean by that is, if you get the empirical formula you, and you're given the molar mass, that's when you can find the molecular formula. If you do not have the molecular formula, you probably can't find the molecular formula, as we'll see. So there's one more wrinkle here, and I just want to mention this. Even compounds with the same molecular formula can have different structures. These are called structural, and uh, here's where there's a typo. These are called structural isomers. Isomers, so please correct that. For example, C2H6O, there are at least two, and I think more, but at least two that uh, have the same molecules with the same molecular formula. And I'm going to draw them out. And again, we're not supposed to be able to do this yet, but I just want to show you what isomers are. So you've got the idea of what an isomer is in the back of your head. So this is one isomer of C2H6O. You can see there are two carbons, there are six hydrogens, and there's one oxygen. And the oxygen has two pairs of dots, which we will see to be electron pairs later on. But if you rearrange the same atoms, so you still have C2H6O, you can get a different arrangement. So these two are isomers. And again, so Let's put that in parentheses for now. Parentheses means uh, something to think about, but not necessary to remember, or let's say not necessary to memorize how to do them until later in the course. When it's later in the course, then I will tell you about isomers again. All right, did I say we were gonna stop? Yes, we're gonna stop there and then we're gonna come back and do an empirical formula problem uh, and continue the notes. So it is 33, 32 on my computer. So we're gonna go till uh, 12, I'm gonna restart at 1240. And in the meantime, uh, I'm going to put up the first page. If I can find it. Ah, and I'll put up the first page are there any questions before I go on break?